That's great. If you have a Bible, you could turn to Colossians chapter 3. Uh, today's topic's a fun one. It's uh, put up with one another. How's that for a topic? And look around. You see how difficult this is going to be. Put up with or bear with one another within and outside the church. There are more varied opinions on things than we've experienced, it seems, in a really long time. And I think one hilarious aspect of that is like if anyone is actually interested in our opinions. But uh, with social media now, they've got the platform to say some of the dumbest things with confidence, right? And, um, and I suppose it's in here too. Our Facebook pages sometimes have that as well. And then we have a crowd of people calling for tolerance. Well, we're going to talk about tolerance today, but as the Bible refers to and as properly defined of what tolerance, putting up with, bearing with one another really is. It's a brief eight-week series on the one another's. There's 34 of them in the Bible where it says you need to be a certain way, one another. There's 22 positive, there's 12 negative. And we're going to look through and scan through some of those today. And how do you put up with, how do you bear one another at work, in your own family, on a sports team, definitely as it refers to here in the local church as well. There is a book that we used to teach out of. Uh, it's an old book now called uh, Parenting Adolescence by Ken Hudgens. Well, in it, it was so funny because in it, he makes that remark, and I'd never actually read it before, and I suppose it's, it's a common thing to say, but maybe not in print, is... In parenting adolescents, what do you do at that point in which you actually don't like the kid anymore? And I remember reading that and going, did he just say that out loud? There's a point in which our kids can go through a phase where I'm not even sure I like them anymore. And what may really hurt is the kids go through the same phase with you. They go to bed at night and just think, man, I just, I'm not sure I'm a big fan of mom. Yeah, I dare you say that out loud. Yeah, starve to death after that. It was, I think it's funny, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens said, he died in 1910, I think. So this is over 100 years ago that he made that remark that every teenager should be put in a barrel with a little hole to feed it, or every child should be. And when that child becomes a teenager, you plug the hole. I'm like, that's over 100 years ago. Apparently, people don't change. And again, a teenager sitting in the room go, yeah, I'd like to put my dad in that barrel and not feed him also. So what do we do? That point in which we really just, we just can't handle it anymore. Maybe somebody at work. I, I just had it. They, they pushed me too far or certainly a family member, they've just pushed too far and don't know what to do. So the subject today is how to put up with one another, how to bear with one another. And if you have the notes, it's in the bulletin. The first one, first point is what true tolerance really is. Two different times, Paul said almost, the, well, said the same thing a little different. Repetition in the Gospels, very common. Repetition in the Psalms, in poetry, proverb, very common. Not as common in Paul's writings, not quite as common. Colossians 3, 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Bear with each other and forgive one another. And if any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave. Now listen to Ephesians. Ephesians 4.2 says, Be completely humble and gentle 
be patient, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another. So make an allowance of somebody's faults. Be tolerant, one translation says. Be tolerant of one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive them. So here we are at church, joined together in a room with a wide variety of backgrounds and, I hope, wide variety of opinions on things. We're called to bear with one another, to put up with one another. So I have, like, good news and bad news. Good news is that everyone who's received Jesus Christ will be swiftly taken up to be forever with God. Is that good news? Bad news is we have to travel there together. Is that not funny? Okay, you're going to have to work with me here. So there's good news and bad news. The good news is that all of those who have faith in Jesus Christ will be caught up and travel together to be with, with God forever. The bad news is, you ready? The bad news is we got to travel there together. <laughs> no, stop it. It wasn't that funny. No, cut it out. Yeah, thanks. Wow, make a note of that. Don't ever tell that joke. In fact, I'm over here. It may not even be a joke. I mean, that, may not, that might be the problem. Tolerance today is this. This is how tolerance is defined today, is if you disagree with me, you're not being tolerant. In fact, if you disagree with me, you could easily be labeled now as a racist or a bigot. This is very, very different. In today's world, tolerance now means that we need to accept everyone's views as equally valid and as truth. It's not true. That's not what tolerance is. When you and I are calling out for somebody to be tolerant, they're instantly not being tolerant. Because tolerance is not for you and I to tell somebody else to be. Tolerance is something for us to be. Which is why you have the Michael Kirks of the world, Stephen Crowder. You have a Ben Shapiro who is going to do a speech at a public campus, and it gets shut down out of tolerance. The irony of this no, the idea is that there is a freedom of free speech and we don't villainize the other person for having a different view. Good tolerance welcomes opposing views and keeps relationships higher than the views. That's tolerance. Remember, there's a, a great little... Uh, you pass right by it in the movie Shadowlands with C.S. Lewis where a little kid is asked, he says, do you believe in heaven? And the little kid says, no, I don't believe in heaven. And C.S. Lewis said, oh, okay. That's tolerance. It's not getting mad at the little kid. This is an apologist. It's C.S. Lewis of all people who would love to correct this kid and would actually have the ability in grace and kindness to correct the kid. And he goes, oh, okay. You're welcome to have that view. Completely disagree with it. And so we have a group of people today who are demanding tolerance and are being the least intolerance that is imaginable. How is it that we can be considered a bigot by saying that we believe that Sex is reserved for a marriage between a man and a woman. How can that be hate speech? We have, we have history behind us, too. This isn't an outrageous statement, right? 30 years ago, it'd be an outrageous statement that I would have to say that and be afraid of consequence. It's just a statement. Can't we talk about it? 
until we talk about that certain lifestyles are an abomination to God. Just not even naming the lifestyle, but I'm going to say there are certain lifestyles that are abomination to the Lord, and, and we have to be afraid of repercussions of that, that we're not being tolerant. <laughs> no, it's the freedom to say. But rather than look at the world and say, you're not being tolerant, we continually be tolerant. We continually put up with and bear with one another. As parents, you don't have a favorite kid out loud. And so, oh, so that was funny. Okay, all right. No, because I didn't script it. That's why that was funny. So we had, um, I got to get all my Ross stories out before May 12th, which is when he's here as youth intern for the summer. He was, he was 10, and he jumps on the end of the bed, and he was, he was, I'm not kidding, he was this tall forever, like even into high school. And I had, I have Googled every famous person in the world that's short. And he can name them even to this day, like Prince, you just got to wear heels like this, on and on and on. So uh, he jumps on the end of the bed, he's so cute, and he says, like kind of quiet. He goes, so I'm your favorite, right? Well, we're already starting to laugh. We think that's very funny. We're like, uh, we're like, no, bud, we can't say that. You can't. That's not true. And then he runs to the family. He goes, well, Emma, she's crazy. She can't be your favorite. She's unpredictable. I'm like, oh, well, she is that. And the oldest, he can't see a thing. How can the blind one possibly be your favorite? And we're like, okay, now we're laughing so hard. I want him out of the room. So I simply said, I'm like, okay, all right, you're our favorite. You're our favorite, Ross. He holds up his hand, he, a recorder, and he says, I got it. I got it. And my, I'm like, oh, he tricked us. Yeah, you know, it's really hard, and it is in a family to non-family to work environment. It is an actual skill to treat people all the same. And they all run through, right? They all run through. Of which is, we're called to bear with one another. It's put up with one another. And that's difficult. But it's actually a target. He said it twice. He said it in Colossians. He said it in Ephesians. Therefore is God's chosen people holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. So stop for a minute. Is there someone that you need to forgive? I'm not saying what they said or did to you wasn't inappropriate because it you may be completely on the right on this but is there somebody that you just you need to let go of it we're actually called to and think of that person those people that's what can happen in politics we're villainizing a group of people because we so much disagree with them. No, that's not what we're called to do. We're called to love and to bear with and not allow that issue to separate us from our love for them. But look again at Colossians 3.13. If they hurt us, forgive them. Forgiveness is mentioned in the same context, and that's, that's very interesting. Bear with each other and forgive one another. Bear with and forgive one another. Gene Getz is a great old author, Moody Bible Institute, and he's a pastor of a church. I think he's written 40, 50 books. He's actually still alive. I think he's 93. So you'll come across Gene Getz books over and over. And a really 
famous one of his was on the one another's actually on this subject a book just written on these 34 one another's and he said bearing with one another and having a forgiving forgiving spirit are synonymous you can't bear with or put up with without forgiving but here's here's the point you and I can't just decide, I'm going to forgive them. i got to forgive them. Put a post-it on a mirror. Forgive them. All right, I'm going to do it. It's actually you can't. You can't forgive. You can't bear with someone unless the forgiveness is in you. So back it up. As you and I receive the total forgiveness of God, we then are able to forgive others. But the mistake is often thinking in the past, for many of us, I came to know Jesus at this age, at this grade or this point in my life, and I receive the forgiveness of God as if that's past tense. Oh, that was critical. That's when we're born into the family of God is when we profess Christ and the journey of our relationship with God begins. But the forgiveness then that we experience in him is a refreshing daily occurrence. Can't be stale. You and I can't rely on forgiveness that happened 15 years ago and think that that is going to just naturally flow through us into the lives of other people because it can't. We go to God regularly and daily for a refreshing dose of his grace and his kindness and that fresh relationship flows through us into the lives of other people. It's just like water, stale water. You don't dip your hand down into the stale water and drink it. You want the flowing water because the flowing water is the clean water. And yet we struggle. We struggle with putting up with and bearing one another. They pushed me too far, and you're trying to muster forgiveness for somebody, and yet the emphasis is not on them and us trying to forgive them. The emphasis is on us going regularly to God to appreciate the forgiveness that he's offered. Once we receive it, or I should say as we receive it, we can pass it on, flowing through us. If we don't receive it, we tend to be critical and judgmental, always wanting to point out the sins of other people. I've mentioned Dietrich Bonhoeffer to you before. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was killed at age 39 in a concentration camp. In fact, it was on April 9th. It was just last week, and a lot of people recognize that, uh, that date. Listen to this line of his. Judging others and justification by works go together. Just as justification by grace and serving others go together. So if your life, you've, conv you've been convinced that you're accepted by God because of your good works... You may have been led that way by a church or organization, might have been led that way because that's how you were accepted by your dad or mom, but it's trained within you that I'm accepted because of my good works. For those that believe that they are justified by works, you will be judgmental of people. But for the one who believes that is, for by grace that you're saved through faith, it's not of yourself, it's the gift of God. For those that live that, that believe that it is by grace only that I am accepted by God, that person, justification by grace and serving others go together. 
You see, your relationship with God is what is dictating relationships with other people. We really could do a case study if we were just able to analyze the depths of how you treat people and how you handle people. I can then get inside there and actually guess what your relationship with God is like, regardless of what you and I say. We'll all quote the verse, grace that we're saved through faith. It's grace only. But then every day that you and I are like, oh, but I'm just not doing enough, and he's disappointed in me, and I'm not, I'm not obedient enough to him, so he looks at me with like a, it's you again, because you're not working hard enough. Yeah, exactly that lack of acceptance by God because of your good works is how you and I will treat other people. So it's more than just saying it. Friends, you and I are separated from God because of our sin forever. There is no relationship with God out of anything that you and I will ever do, ever. Sin separated us. Really, the story was over until God sent Jesus Christ to live a sinless life accept the penalty of sin in death for us, rose on the third day, conquered sin, conquered death, so that anyone who believes in him has a relationship with God, eternal life. That's it. That is the only reason you and I can get up in the morning and open our Bible and pray and read and we have communion with him. The only reason is because of what Jesus Christ has done for us in your belief and trust in him only. Look at verse 13 one more time. Starting in verse 12, Colossians 3:12, "Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you." Third point in the outline is receive people as Jesus received us. Forgive as the Lord forgave. So think for a second. How would you describe how God forgave you? Think about this for a minute. Because it says forgive as the Lord forgave you. It begs the question, how did he forgive you? What words would you put to that? How did God forgive you? Think of a couple words for us. What's that? He loved you. Unconditionally. I'm going to write these down, so if I ever teach this again, I'm going to, have, I'm going to use this as an outline. I'll say, these are the things that came to me as I was studying the passage. What's that? Is this child? How did he forgive you? Give traits of that forgiveness. How did he forgive you? Ooh, all-encompassing. Completely. Right? Completely. How about continually? How about freely? We didn't have to twist his arm. So that's how he forgave us. So we forgive others that way. So let's use the same words. So somebody that hurt you, and it could be a family member, and they still are, not just still our family, but they're still hurting you. Maybe from something that happened a long, long time ago, and you just... It's just really hard to let go of that. A student at school 
could be a teacher. How do we forgive them? And what he, God did for us is, well, what we did to God is far worse. What we've done to God is far worse than anything anyone has ever done to us. Are we okay with that? Right? Okay. So, even though the stakes were so far higher with relationship with God, we are to forgive the one that hurt you. You are to forgive them unconditionally. You're to love them. You're to forgive them completely and freely. And this one I love continually. You know when it says to forgive how many times, right? Peter had to, was it Peter? Had to come up with the how many times? Seventy, seven times, seventy times, seven times. How do you forgive them? So that means every time they offend you, you got to keep forgiving them. I actually think that it's more like it's even one thing they did to you that I relive that and I have to forgive them again. I'm done. Oh, good. God, I feel so free. I forgave them. I let go of it. And 20 minutes later, I'm mad about it again. And I have to forgive them again. Two days later, oh, they made me so mad. I got to forgive them again. Forgive them over and over and over and over. Then it creates that pattern, changes that, those neuro pathways where we're actually living in a consistent forgiveness of them. Because God has forgiven us continually. I think you know another favorite uh, character of mine in history is Corey Tin Boone. Uh, I was actually sitting with, uh, I don't know if I think we probably talked about Rick Ingram. I was sitting with Rick uh, right before we moved back here, and we're chatting, and different things came up, and he said growing up, uh, his dad was friends with Corey Tin Boone, and she would be at their house. And I'm like, stop it. That is impossible. She died in like yeah, 83. So, and I went, that's impossible. He goes, oh, no, and I didn't even know enough to appreciate it because they'd have lunch together, and it's Corey, and they'd all just enjoy their time, and then he'd run off and do his thing. He goes, but looking back, I wish I just sat there. And, of course, the famous hiding place, and maybe some of you have been there. We have just to see over 800 people's lives were saved during the Nazi regime through that hiding place and through her and her family. Her whole family was killed. She's the only one that got out. Was the sweetest soul. But I thought when it came to forgiveness and bearing with, putting up with, I start reviewing some of the things that she has said. Listen to this, this line. I wish I could say after a long and fruitful life of traveling the world that I've learned to forgive all of my enemies. I wish I could say that merciful and charitable thoughts just naturally flowed from me onto others. But they don't. There's one thing I've learned since I've passed my 80th birthday. It's that, ready for this? I can't store up good feelings and behavior, but only draw them fresh from God every day. Oh. You imagine the faces that she sees in the middle of the night, the experiences. Ravensbrück concentration camp was one of the worst. That's where she was. Went in with a slew of family and barely made it out alone and alive. Do you think she had some forgiveness issues? So I kind of just sit back and I'm like, okay, I'm not even worthy to read your sentences. Also knowing the sweet heart that she had. But to hear her say, 
Oh, I would hope that after 80 years, it just would flow from me, but it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I have to draw them fresh every day. So many of us are reading Oswald Chambers as many times as we can throughout the day, right? A lot of you guys doing that still? Yeah, and if you don't have that, it's around the corner. You can grab one. It's just a book, and you can grab it for free and read along with. And that's not even quite it. It's that you and I are in the regular habit of opening our Bible and just sitting there for a moment and going, oh, Lord, I don't deserve to be here except for Jesus. Thank you. So grateful that I can read your word today. God, I need your forgiveness today like I do every day. I'm sorry for my bad thoughts, my behaviors. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness and kindness and acceptance. See what you're doing? You're allowing all of that grace of God to flow into your life so that it cleanses and then flows through us into the lives of others. And when you and I stop that from flowing into us, now we're doing it mechanically like an engine without oil. We're trying to run this thing, and we're struggling. We're wondering, why can't I let go of that? Why do I have trouble loving these types of people or this person? God, I'm asking, making you, just please make me do that. And he goes, no, no, I'm not making you do anything. Soak in the forgiveness on yourself. You deserve it. He's done it for you. It's for free. He loves you. Receive the grace and the kindness and the forgiveness of God that is only available through Jesus Christ. You didn't earn it. You're not living up to it but you get it by faith. Enjoy that. And then empowered for your day, you can offer that out of your life into the lives of very undeserving people. I know that because that's how we are. It's the same setup. And it's not your forgiveness that you're freely giving. It's not your grace and kindness. It's His. He gave it to you in an abundance, and it's able to flow through you into the lives of other people. You and I can't take a bear with one another, put up with one another, and have it as a check and say, I've done it today, and I can do it. I, I've learned enough that I can do it. No. Wish I could say that merciful and charitable thoughts just naturally flowed from me, but they don't. I can't store up good feelings and behavior, but only draw them fresh from God every day. And that's the encouragement for us today. If this isn't something else to do, ah, oh, great, now I got to put up with people. You know, Pastor, if you'd met my family, you'd know how hard that really is. No, all our families are hard to put up with at different times, aren't they? Sorry if they're sitting next to you right now. <laughs> Awkward moment. <laughs> no, we all are, and coworkers, and on a sports team. There's no one that gets along better than a sports team, and there's no one that fights more than people on a sports team. It's just the way it is. Let's not beat ourselves up for not being forgiving enough. Let's enjoy the forgiveness of God, His grace, daily, and then watch that continually cleanse and flow into the lives of others. You agree with me? Isn't that encouraging? He's done it for us. It's just allowing Him to keep doing it through us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, for the one in this room who have never placed their faith in you, that they would do it right now. They turn their heart to you in gratitude and thanks for the sacrifice of Jesus and believe in him. For all of us that this week we just raise the level of soaking in your kindness and forgiveness and grace so that it can flow all the more through us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.